Hello all and welcome to today's Bailey Glasser webinar from People to Billions, what you need to know about NFTs. If you have questions during today's program, please submit them to questions at baileyglasser.com. We'll be running through some slides today to, to help guide the discussion. If you're having trouble viewing the slides, you can use a slider in the middle of your screen to make them either larger or smaller. And with that, I would like to introduce you to today's panelists, Bailey Glasser attorneys, Michael Hawthorne and Carlos Duque, as well as special guest Brian Cho, founder and CEO of Hello Ray, and Jacob Schrader, G GM of eSports at Zen Sports. Carlos, you ready to kick this off? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for attending from Beeple to Billions. What you need to know about NFTs, obviously, it's just an incredibly um, hot space. And uh, especially with the crypto winter, there's you know no shortage of really exciting topics to discuss in this matter. Um, let me introduce myself and my co-panelists quickly before we uh, jump in. Um, but before I do that, remember that if there are any questions pop up during the webinar, please uh, send them to questions at baileyglasser.com. My name is Carlos Duque. I'm an attorney. I run the ES Esports and DFS group uh, within the within uh, the corporate department at Bailey and Glasser. Uh, I've been doing this kind of legal work in the DeFi and crypto and NFT space for, I don't know, five, six years. I've been, a, I've been an attorney for 12 and about half of that has spent, has been spent with a very serious focus uh, in this space. Uh, if I could just boast for a second, um, you know, two of our panelists who will be joining us today, uh, both Hello Ray and Zen Sports. I'm proud to share, to share our clients of ours at Bailey and Glasser. Uh, and also Splinterlands may be a familiar name, as I would call them the largest crypto gaming company in the world, depending on how you measure, and I'm proud to say that they're a client as well. So there's a lot of exciting folks that, that we work with here at Bailey Glasser in the space and always delighted to engage in the conversation. Um, I will briefly introduce my, my co-host, uh, Michael DeLeon Hawthorne. He's a partner, uh, at head of the securities group here at Bailey Glasser. I don't know, he's got 20, 30 years of experience, uh, trained at uh, white shoe firms uh, in Chicago uh, and elsewhere, uh, such as um, Sidley, and he's just a phenomenal attorney, and he's wonderful because he's you know, classically trained, so he can help us navigate some of these brand new tech issues with the lens of you know, traditional corporate and securities law, because ultimately, uh, folks like the SEC and other enforcement agencies are definitely going to get involved. So we need to kind of foresee a little bit what uh, the law looks like when it's, you know, frankly, actually applied in the space, which it doesn't seem to be very much at the moment. But that could change at any time. Uh, allow me to take a moment to allow my other guests to introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to start with Brian Cho. He's the founder and CEO of Hello Ray. Uh, Brian, you want to take a minute to say hello? Tell us a little bit yeah. about yourself and your interest in the space. Yeah, definitely. So, founder of Hello Ray, we're a marketplace for contract furniture designers. Um, and, you know, what led me to Web3 and NFTs was actually thinking and trying to push the needle on how products are merchandised digitally. And, you know, funny enough, we were we received inquiries from pretty large brands in the contract furniture space about this idea of metaverse, right? Which is very much synonymous with NFTs, right? And Web3. And so that led me down kind of this 15 month rabbit hole of getting to interact with various projects that are launching NFTs, DeFi protocols. Um, yeah, and so, you know, I learned by doing, and I think I got pretty heavily involved with a couple of projects and, you know, all in hopes of bringing furniture brands into the metaverse and dropping their NFTs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to move on to our, our next special guest, Jacob Schrader, who's the GM of eSports at Zen Sports. Jacob, uh, same question to you. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest and experience in the space, please? Of course. So I'm Jacob. I'm the GM of eSports at Zen Sports. Um, Zen Sports is a crypto-focused sports betting and esports tournament hosting platform, right? So on the sports betting side, we use crypto as a reward system, right? So we have our own dedicated utility token that's used for cashback rewards in kind of a more holistic and also tangible way than traditional sports books will do. Um, so, you know, you make a lot of bets on Zen Sports, you take a lot of bets, you don't withdraw often, 
uh, you'll get cash back bonuses and sports tokens. And because you know that's a, a token with tangible utility, it can be exchanged for Ethereum, you know, or, or other tokens. Um, and on the esports side, we actually partner with a lot of the biggest blockchain esports titles. So that's a lot of where a lot of my experience in the space comes from. But right? I remember I was looking maybe two years ago at Board Ape Yacht Clubs and all these mainstream NFTs, and I didn't really get the 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 the, the value proposition because in esports, right, the tangible ownership of NFT cards and NFT assets, it's clear as day to me. Uh, so I was wrong for not investing in a lot of those um, mainstream NFTs. But I think you know esports is a great use case for NFTs, and and that's kind of where I'm focused. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I'm sure there's a lot of folks. So yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think Carlos, we lost Carlos, but yeah, I think he was saying there's a lot of use cases for NFTs, esports yeah. being one. Um, and there's probably a lot of people FOMOing over uh, not having invested early in the NFT world. Yeah, you know. Cool. I, I think we can just move on. Carlos will join us back in a, sec a second. Um, but today, you know, we're going to give people a general overview of the NFT industry, right? I think a great way to to talk about NFTs and give some insight into them is to compare them to cryptocurrencies, you know, why they're different. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that. We'll go through some case studies. Um, we'll do some trends in the industry if we, we can get to that, right? There's a lot we can talk about with NFTs. So we're really going to spend a day getting to what we get to. And in our next session, we'll just expand on that. Um, intellectual property rights. Obviously, we have some lawyers here that can do a good job talking about that. Um, but I think I think this is this is me to, to explain what is an NFT. Um, right. An NFT is a non fungible token. And that just differs from Bitcoin or Ethereum in, in, the, in the sense that, you know, those currencies are fungible. Right. Every Bitcoin is the same as every other Bitcoin. Every, you know, Ethereum is the same as every other Ethereum. And that's why you can fractionalize them. Right. That's why they're great currencies. But NFTs are all unique. Right. They all have unique metadata. You know, they're not fractionable. Um, and, and that's just a, a general understanding to, to, you know, aid in why NFTs are different from the cryptocurrencies you see. Yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the legal issues relating to this is, you know, is a Bitcoin a security? Is an NFT a security? It's hard to know what exactly some of these items will be in the long run because, you know, like a non-fungible token could be a, a one-item picture and it's not really a security, it's more a piece of artwork, but it also could be a membership interest that has other benefits associated with it. And is it a membership interest or is it tradable? These these things have not been determined. So it's looking just at the name of NFT or uh, cryptocurrency, it, it's hard to know exactly what all laws will apply to each category. Yeah, that's a great point, Michael. Thank you everyone for taking over. Um, I am having some tech issues today. So if I fall off, please keep running without me. I'll be back as quickly as I can. And And that's a great question. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, and Michael, it's really uh, worth taking a minute to, to talk about the legal test that, that Michael's kind of implicitly referencing. Um, it's called the Howey test, which most folks have heard about in a blog or two. And there's definitely a number of, of different laws that could apply, as Michael stated. Um, the one that jumps out at me most saliently, um, depending on how these projects are structured, are those securities laws. And that's, you know, uh, you have federal and state securities laws in, in the United States designed to protect investors, which have pretty uh, burdensome disclosure requirements and other obligations that an issuer, the person taking the money, has to comply with in order to remain, you know, uh, to, to behave in a lawful way. And there's very strict penalties for not complying. And it's one of the unique areas of law where your state of mind, your mens rea, your culpable intent is not particularly relevant. If you violated the securities laws, it doesn't matter so much whether you intended to rip anybody off. It's sort of a strict liability offense. Um, and the, the, you know, the million dollar question typically is, is it a security to start with, as Michael referenced? Now, the Howey test is simply put, it's a three pronged test, uh, which says if it's an investment of something of value, typically money in some kind of pooled asset 
where there's an expectation of profit based mostly or entirely on the efforts of others, then you have a security. And the most important part of that test, the operative part is uh, typically here is going to be whether there's an expectation of profit, whether the investment is made with the hope of, of generating a, a return on that investment in terms of net gain. And uh, obviously you can't, you know, the SEC can't cut open someone's head and look in to see what they were thinking. But the easiest way to shortcut that test is to look at what representations were made by the issuer at the time that they accepted um, the, the purported investment, right? So, uh, you know, to Michael's point, if it's just one issuance of an NFT that's designed to be put on the wall and for you to enjoy in the privacy of your home, and that's the way it's marketed as just a fabulous piece of art, that's unlikely to ever be found to be a security. However, I'm seeing more and more of these projects where you have a famous artist that's got a series going, you know, that says this is one of 20, uh, and I'm going to work diligently to, to pump these babies out. So they're going to keep going, increasing in value because just like the board of API club, they're part of a series and they may have some important um, uh, airdrops coming in. There's going to have other privileges. You're going to be invited to, to, you know, VIP events. If the Rolling Stones are ever in town, you'll get backstage tickets, whatever it is, you know, hang out with Mick Jagger. And those promises are now, you know, uh, you know, and, and they'll even go so far as say, oh, and this is going to increase 20% guaranteed, you know, something silly like that. That's really where you cross the line and you're in a very dangerous area uh, asking the, the government to come after you for violating the securities laws. Michael, would you agree with that summary? Is there anything you want to add or subtract? I, I agree with that. And, and it, it, it will get dicey whether or not it is a security or not a security. But when you make promises, you know, when things are going up in value, which they've been going up a lot in value over the last couple of years for of the, the uh, these types of items. Nobody worries too much about what was said or, or done. Now that we're in a crypto winter, I think a lot of these disclosures and terms and conditions are being thoroughly read. And a lot of people are now complaining because they've lost all their money or a big chunk of their money. So it's usually on the downside markets when all of a sudden now everybody starts reading and the attitude was this is you know unregulated we could do anything we want well the laws still apply and we're going to see how this shakes out right right everyone thinks that it's a classic error to say oh it's a new technology therefore old law doesn't apply it does it just might be in a slightly different way but the sheriffs always come to town eventually um, so let's let's bring our guests into this a little bit more. Um, you know, Brian, is there are there any exciting projects that you've seen recently that that you want to talk about and and uh, discuss some of the some of the trends that you're seeing? Uh, yeah, in the market? yeah, I think um, so. One of the things that you know we need to understand about NFTs is that there is this thing called minting, where you mint an asset to the blockchain. Where you're saying, hey, me as a user, I'm investing in gas fees to basically control a node on a, within the blockchain to assign that non-fungible token to you, right? Um, and I think what, what's ended up happening with a lot of the projects is that they've realized having a high mint cost, which goes directly to the, you know, let's just say, depending on how the project is structured, um, it can go straight to the treasury to be reinvested for like development or marketing. But the days of high mint prices, so you're talking about like $2,000 to mint an asset, kind of faded away into, you know, more of a free mint, right? So one of the most recent success stories was, a, you know, uh, a project Goblin Town, right? They were a free mint and they had really no roadmap. And I think that was the kind of, also a defining characteristic of uh, of these types of projects that are becoming successful is that they're not making grand, like grandiose promises. They're saying, hey, here's a project, you can mint it for free if you're like one of the lucky, you know, 10,000 people who managed to mint one. And, you know, if there is a roadmap, it's TBD. And I think that goes back to what you were saying, you know, there, when you start making promises, things get a little bit more complicated. So now these projects are saying, hey, no promises, right? And, and what's ending up happening, it's all hype, right? So they're doing a very good job marketing the project from the outset because you know, who who doesn't like to spend, you know, 
ten dollars in gas fees to mint something instead of four hundred dollars to mint an asset, right? That you then non fungibly tied to you, right? Or that non fungible token is tied to you. So I think you know that that has persisted for the last like month during this kind of NFT slash crypto winter. But I would say now the meta uh, is shifting more towards charging like a very minimum fee, like a 0.02 ETH, because now everyone is creating. Um, you know, they're, they're creating free mints all the time. It's like a lot of noise, right? So, you know, how does someone set this, set themselves uh, apart? It's like, hey, we're gonna charge 0.02 ETH and give you a little teaser about the roadmap, right? Um, so you're, you're starting to see these uh, combinations kind of come up. Uh, one, one project I'm particularly excited about is, uh, is a storytelling NFT. And they're, you know, on the, I know they're Hollywood backed and they raised, you know, something around like 50, 60 million from a tier one VC. And I think you're starting to see actual NFT projects be structured more like businesses, right? Um, and I think those are the best NFT projects where, hey, take that NFT portion out of it. It can op operate as almost like a Web2 entity, right? And I think, you know, because there are so many scamming uh, projects out there, I think people are kind of going, Oh, yes, they're still risky in the sense that they're in NFTs, but they're mitigating that risk by investing in things that they can recognize and feel comfortable with, which is like almost like a web team. Yeah, that's really fast. Thank, thank you for that. Go ahead, Je Go ahead, Jacob. You know, I think what Justin was saying, or sorry, Brian, you were saying about the new meta. Uh, you know, I love that phrasing, first of all, because I come from gaming, but also you know, it, I think it's really good for the NFT industry because it puts kind of a more marginal business model to play, right? They're making money off the reselling of the NFTs, which is great because while it's sad to see someone go, you know, someone's, someone new is coming in and, you know, a, a more liquid asset is just better. Um, and, you know, the reason why it's good for these NFT companies is because they make anywhere from two and a half to 5% on every transaction, even after the mint. Right. And it's just a more healthy model because it incentivizes longevity in the project. Uh, and, and, you know, that's good. And that's something that we're seeing a lot with blockchain games. Right. We mentioned Splinterlands earlier. That's kind of, you know, what they do. They have a marketplace on their game. Uh, it's on the high blockchain and they take 5% on all transactions. Right. On top of that, they built out, you know, fully fledged renting system. Um, and, and it just has created a, a, a greater sense of community and just a business model that will last a long time. Uh, one question I had for Carlos and Michael is, you know, Ryan mentioned the NFT Goblin Town that was, you know, originally sold for nothing. You know, how does that impact the classification of a security, right? Can it ever be called a security because it's sold for nothing, right? I don't, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm really asking. Wow, that's a great question. Can it be a security if there's zero consideration of the initial? Issuance. Uh, I would I would hazard a guess that it's, it still has value on the secondary market then potentially. But I'm going to go to our expert, uh, Michael Hawthorne. What do you how do you feel that one? Well, one of the ways is one of the questions on what has value is a lot of these NFTs. One of the reasons you're issuing it is it has other privileges and contained in it or other things that are going to happen with it. So if it's a single like I gave the artwork away for free and there's no other thing connected with it, it's hard to say that that's a security, you know, because you just put it out there. But if you created a trading market and you're encouraging the trades or taking a fee for every time it trades, or you're adding features to the NFT, because one of the exciting things about NFTs is you can verify the ownership on the blockchain to know if it's the original one. You can also give it other rights and things that are only connected to that NFT. So the devil's probably in the details. But yeah, I would, you know, yeah. But the NFT is, you know, the traditional NFT, NFT might not really be a security, but you got to watch out for the other laws. We've, we're having a similar problem somewhat with, you know, cryptocurrencies because cryptocurrencies, a lot of people feel, including, uh, you know, one of the people on the, at the SEC, says it's not a currency or Bitcoin. He's clarified that it, Bitcoin, I believe he has said, is not a security or a currency. But is it? You know, is it a security? And I'm, you know, the law is going to develop in this area. It, it's kind of unknown right now, parts of it. Yeah. 
I don't think Bitcoin's going to be ever deemed a security. So maybe some more of the, you know, less mainstream ones potentially. And that's entirely my opinion and not legal advice that anyone should be relying on. That's more of wild <laughs> speculation that, on that my is, part. That, well, that is a disclaimer on both sides because part of it is we could say something is a cryptocurrency, but then the devil's in the detail. They function very differently. You know, they're not all the same. So uh, the decentralized nature, I think, provides some level of protection because, you know, who's the issuer? If you don't have an issuer, then it's hard for someone to be held legally responsible for the problems related to that issuance. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely more, I think, if the enforcement and the issues are definitely going to come up more so on these projects where the wild promises are made at the get-go. And, and like I said, you don't have to have culpable intent. You don't have to have an intent to defraud anyone to land yourself with civil or even criminal penalties under the, the U.S. and state securities laws. Um, so even if an artist believes he's going to do a series of 10 but gets tired or bored or sick or whatever uh, and only does three and the project sort of falls apart halfway through, uh, that in itself could potentially be a violation depending on how the thing's marketed. So again, a real warning to everyone, be very careful about making promises about future events and especially about a particular return on investment. Uh, be careful before you encourage people who are participating in your project, your community, to uh, expect a profit from that project. If you really need, <laughs> if, if you really feel that their expectation of a profit is key to the functioning of your project, then you need to call, uh, you know, competent securities counsel who can advise you on how to run that issuance in a compliant way because again uh not to scare anyone but you know it's it's not that difficult to land in jail for violating the securities laws um let's turn to uh to uh people uh i wanted i'm going to go to jacob on this one but why don't you give us your thoughts on this 69 million dollar sale uh, of of an NFT in March of of 21 is is this real? Is this sustainable? I mean, obviously we kind of know the answer already, not completely. But what trend are you seeing with this kind of activity in the market using the the Beeple as a as a case study? Yeah, so so Beeple is a really famous digital artist, right? This was not his first NFT sale, and he was doing something famous, I believe, on Twitter where he was putting out a a fully fledged and really professional piece of digital artwork every single day, right? So he was basically developing a reputation as a digital artist and, you know, kind of got into the NFT space. I think he sold one for like three and a half million, um, you know, a little bit before this one. Um, and, and to me, this is a little bit different than kind of the security NFTs we've been talking about, where there's no promise of, of anything. There's no promise of, of future value, right? This is just art and it's digital art in the form of an NFT. Right, you know, we, we know that the real Mona Lisa sells for a, a lot more than copies that may be exactly similar, right? They're even, you know, copies that have been painted, um, but they weren't painted by Vincent Van Gogh, I believe. I, I really would hate to be wrong on that one. But, uh, <laughs> you know. It, You're it's, wrong on that one. <laughs> oh my gosh, well, whatever. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Keep I'm, going. Not a, I'm not an art guy, um, but th th that's what this is. It's just art, right? It's. Uh, it's art and it's digitally certified by the blockchain. Um, and that's why it's sold for 69 million because it's a one of one piece. Um, that's, that's how I feel about people. All right, and let's talk about it. And, and Brian, open it up to you as well at any time. But, uh, you know, I heard... Uh, I think we just lost Carlos again, but I, I actually couldn't make out what he was about to say. Could you, Jacob? <laughs> No, I, well, I, think, I, okay. I think where he was headed was he was going to talk about well, what what happened with the sixty nine million dollar investment and how did that yeah. proceed? Like, what's the current status of kind of that digital art? Like, to wrap up this story, you know, I feel like you know at least people's digital art. I mean, is it still worth sixty nine million? Probably not. I mean. You take something like Jack Dorsey's tweet that someone paid $2.9 million for, uh, he ended up selling it for under $14,000. So just to kind of get a sense of the, uh, the, the massive fluctuations in this space in terms of these digital uh, NFTs, but you know, I, it's tough to say because I'm gonna have to, I would have to look to see if the, that specific people NFT is up for sale. And if so, what's, what's the list price? Um, yeah. And 
yeah. one of the one of my comments said is, you know, digital medium is just another form. I mean, we think of painting something. You know, digital art is going to be more accepted and will have some dynamic features when it's embedded with the NFT. You also, because it's on the blockchain, and the original, you can always figure out who did the original because it's on the blockchain. You have better verification that you own it and you might embed certain features on it versus like a screenshot. I mean, there may be more interactions or more whatever, different types of displays. Cause like, you know, they're now, you know, TV company, you know, people that make TVs are now producing TVs just to display digital art. I mean, this is not going, this will, I think there's only going to be more digital art. Yeah, and and I think um, that's the know, question that I wanted. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, and, and it, I I was actually going to go touch upon this uh, when when Jacob's chatting about kind of his gaming background. I I came from a gaming background as well. Sold virtual items probably in 2005 to 2010. And think about it, it's like that's actually a natural segue. There's already an industry of people who are buying and selling virtual items and games, uh, the NFTs and kind of having blockchain as the kind of the technology that powers, you know, who owns what and whether or not that asset is actually legitimate, that's actually will help make that process of buying and reselling assets within a game a little bit more secure. Um, I'll give you one example of this. So the game that I, I used to kind of sell, sell items on, basically people would basically duplicate a, an item in the database. So it would have the same unique ID. So let's just say I sell that I, that item to Jacob. And then all of a sudden the server's like, hey, we've got to get rid of all these duplicate items. What ends up happening is it gets erased from his wallet, meaning he then loses that asset that he bought with real USD. And there's no recourse, right? Because it was actually some hacker cheated and du duplicated an item. Whereas with the blockchain, you would actually be able to see, hey, like where did this product, where did this asset come from? And was it like duplicated? Is it unique? And um you know, I, I do think like going back to the trend things, gaming is going to be pretty huge. I think. Yeah, and and you uh, know, with I, I your, couldn't agree with more. With your example, Brian, you know, if if we were using blockchain, you'd be able to tell where the hack came from, right? And and who orchestrated it and started it, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to go into the wallets and and take the extra items away from the non-hackers, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of a balance, um, you know. Yeah. You, you have more more info and insight, but you know you're you're kind of left as just a regular player in the decentralized world when when that sort of thing happens. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There is no centralized organization that's going to be like, hey, you know, Jacob took this item, uh, you know, and, and he did it in an illicit manner. Like they they won't be able to pull it back from you. What what the marketplaces can do though, like an OpenSea, which is an NFT marketplace. They can freeze the sale of that asset when they, there's evidence that that has been stolen. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so, it's an interesting um, idea. Right. The, yeah. Uh, and it, it, you got it. Yeah. That's such an interesting space right now, um, especially, you know, and that's really the, the critical thing to think about is what's your exchange, what's your open C that you're interacting with. We recently saw a, a fascinating case out of New York. State Supreme Court, which sounds very sexy, but it's actually the trial court uh, at New York. It's uh, Judge Andrea Maisley, who I'm in front of on something else, actually. And, and I was shocked that it was her that was breaking new ground on this. Um, she granted a motion to serve certain legal papers uh, in connection with a temporary restraining order on an anonymous wallet via, you know, NFT drop. And she signed off on that. So basically, it's like saying legally, you know, uh, dear, you know, Gustafer 2.0 or whatever your random, you know, gamer tag is, you have now been served. And if you don't show up in New York State Court at this time and this place to defend this motion, then we could potentially issue an order uh, freezing uh, these allegedly misappropriated Bitcoin. And I think it was went to the tune of $1.2 million were frozen in that wallet based on that order. So uh, again, really interesting trend uh, to see that you are, are see, you know, you can now have enforcement of all sorts of laws, even through 
uh, an anonymous username, whereas I'm sure before a lot of people would have assumed that not being doxxed would give them uh, certain levels of protection from the authorities, and it just turns out that that's not really the case. So, um, and going back to Brian's point that he, he touched on earlier about how, you know, these projects are, I, I don't know if you said it today or, or last time, but how these projects, now that you can see, you can look for more of a strong team and a strong track record to really uh, set apart the, the wheat from the chaff. Is that a trend that you see moving forward, Brian? Is that, you know, you're going to, I think you mentioned that last time, you, you see a little bit less anonymity in the space. Uh, yes. And that kind of correlating with more compliance and with more, uh, you know, general uh, confidence and integrity. Is, is that what you're thinking? Definitely. And I actually think, um, you know, there's, there are people within the industry that are already well respected. So people is a good example. He's not only a seller of art, but like people tend to follow his buys. Um, and so I think if let's just say people or pack is another kind of famous, uh, digital designer, but if they do a drop, there's, there's usually a lot of momentum already behind it because they know who that person is. They have something to lose. It's when you have nothing to lose, right. Uh, or seemingly nothing to lose until the government decides to, you know, say, Hey, like we're going to figure out who you are. Right. Which, which they're fully capable of doing. Uh, you know, I, I think there is, there's definitely this idea of like a docs team that, that people appreciate. And it's not just some like random LinkedIn profile. Actually, people will dig and try to figure out like, okay, what has this person done right within this space? Like, why should I be investing in them? Don't get me wrong. Not, you know, due diligence doesn't always happen. Right. Some people may see a free mint and be like, Oh my God, let me just mint it. But like for something with a lot of hype surrounding it, and, kind of like a higher mid price, you will see a lot of people actually doing their due diligence and posting on NFT Twitter. So if you do get started in this journey, like follow the right people on Twitter, you'll learn a lot, um, as well as about like which emerging projects are gonna be like, of interest to invest into. And um, in those cases, you'll find out information about these founders as to whether or not they are capable of doing what they're promising to do with their NFT. And you know, secondly, like you could probably infer whether or not you're going to make more money if you get in at the very bottom. Or top, I guess. Right. right? Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I also wanted to kind of like talk about you know this idea of the government, right, seizing your assets, and what you think is kind of like okay, it's in a hot wallet. I'm able to kind of hide and move crypto. That's not always the case. I mean, Bitfinex they got hacked in 2016, and it was this couple that you know initially it was only like a uh, hundred thousands or so bitcoin and it wasn't a, a big deal because the sec didn't like the government didn't think it was a big enough no, like monetary value until bitcoin hit like 50 60k then it turned into a 4.5 billion dollar theft um and actually the government did order to seize those assets and they did find out who did it and you know there's that couple is actually pressing charges or getting charges pressed against them yep for this you know pretty large uh you know, think of it as like a modern day Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I, I think you got to be careful. I think the exchanges kind of operate as the, I mean, the, the ins and outs of crypto, right? So, you know, them being somewhat centralized and having relationships with the government, I don't see it as the worst thing in the world, right? It does take away from some element of, you know, decentralization, but you need some sort of protection, right? You can't have theft going on and, and just free clearance for people to withdraw those funds and take money from others, right? When the intervention needs to happen, I think it's good that these exchanges are, are able to work with the government, you know, use their centralized power to, to make some things right. Yeah. Guys, we're getting really close to time. I wanted to get deeper into one or two of these projects. I don't know if you're jumping out of your chair to discuss like Rovutu or, or LinksDAO. Um, maybe we can touch on on one of them for uh, two or three minutes before we wrap. Does anybody want to jump in? Uh, so I, 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 I can do links now. Um, <laughs> do it. You know, I, I love that one. And I don't even golf, right? But I saw that Steph Curry was in it and someone else who, you know, had a lot of sway in the NFT space kind of recommended it to me. And this is, you know, post, uh, post mint. Um, I bought in probably three months ago. It, it's gone up maybe 60%, but I don't really plan on selling it. 
you know, the value of LinkStyle comes from the partnerships they've established due to the community they built originally. Right. So it's acting somewhat as, as a regular business where they have a community around them that loves LinkStyle, that loves each other. Uh, and, you know, because of that kind of uh, momentum, the partnerships they've established, their, their community members spend more money at, at, at these places. So I'm talking about places like Five Iron Golf, Top Golf, both of which are like driving ranges and simulator places. But then, you know, Callaway, right? I get 15% off retail Callaway products just for owning this NFT and golf clubs are expensive, right? You can spend $2,000 on a, a set of drivers and, or a full set of clubs, right? And you'll make back, what it, you know, what is it? Almost $300, right? If you spend 2000, so that's a, that's a really good value proposition. And because they're able to probably have additional partnerships where they make some money off the top, right? Maybe they're marketing partnerships, sponsorships, stuff like that. Right, you know, it, it's a subscription model to some degree, and they're operating as a, a real business. Um, so that's one I'm super bullish on, uh, Brian. I think you may be too. Yeah, yeah, and I've always maintained that it wasn't, you know, the, the kind of digital art piece was just the tip of the iceberg, and I think the subscriptions are are very interesting. I think the idea of you know subscriptions to to kind of like a Soho house, right? I think that's going to start becoming a thing. I'm in a, I'm in a project where you're connected to other entrepreneurs, right? Uh, or people in the Web3 space, like a top five bank head of Web3 out in Southeast Asia, you know, I can have a normal conversation with this person just because I own the same NFT as them. And I think you're going to start seeing more of that, right? And especially as anonymity is kind of being removed, you're having not only doxed founders, but now you're having doxed people, right? Like that's, NFT New York City, NFT LA, NFT Miami. These these are people that you know you may see as like a you know Discord handle like Coffee Cup One Two Three. Well, it actually turns out to be someone who's like actually doing something very interesting outside of NFTs that you can relate to. And I think we're going to start seeing that because I think um, NFTs are starting to go a little bit more offline, a little bit more in person, right? So whether it's at a yacht or a golf club or a golf course uh, that you're gonna you know, tee off with a bunch of link style members, I think we're gonna start seeing the kind of the anonymity fade away and that's gonna be a good thing for this entire industry. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I really have been quite impressed um, with the quality of the kind of cultural exchanges at places like NFT, uh, NYC in particular. I mean, I saw some incredible performance art and the tickets weren't tickets, they were just invitations to the NFT holders. So there's really, you know, I think the importance and the value proposition of that community uh, really can't be overstated. And I think that's a critical element of uh, all of these projects uh, moving forward. I'm excited to see how that, you know, develops, whether it's based on some kind of shared uh, financial interest or a cultural interest or whatever it may be. I definitely felt a strong connection, you know, with everyone who had been brought together uh, as a result of their participation in the project, what, what, whatever it may be. Anyway, we're and I'm not even going to go to Michael on the link style because once he starts talking about putters, he will never stop. Uh, so I think I'm going to wrap um, for now. But I can't, uh, you know, I can't thank you guys enough for for joining the program today. Again, if there's any questions, email us at questions Bailey and Glasser, uh, questions at baileyglasser.com. Huge thank you to to Brian Cho of Hello Ray, uh, to Jacob Schrader of Zen Sports, can't thank you enough for your time. And folks out there, if you're thinking about doing a project, participating in a project, you have problems, the regulator called, whatever it may be, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it. As you can see, it's not just a couple of, of attorneys here. We have really uh, wonderful connections in the space and friends and clients out there that we can call upon to participate in your NFT issuance or whatever it may be. So. Uh, definitely reach out. Our info is there, um, and we never tire of, of discussing the subject. Always happy to hear from folks out there in the space. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. It's Carlos Duque, uh, you know, head of the DeFi and Esports at Bailey Glass. Just signing off. Thank you so much for joining today. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.